name is Ethan. I'm an exercise physiologist and a strength conditioning specialist. I went to school originally for athletic training, and I ended up switching over to exercise physiology. And the combination of the two really gave me insight on a lot of things uh, that kind of falls into the category of what you see there, which is posture and pain and injuries, injury prevention, rehab, prehab. Uh, so as I went through the process, I kind of came to the conclusion that there's one disease, and its name is congestion. A lot of us have a lot of postural tendencies and imbalances within ourselves. No one's perfect. Uh, males are actually going to be never, ever perfect because we have crooked diaphragm, so our ribs are kind of offset. But it's trying to stay in the most biomechanical state that we can. So we've got a cross leg there, a crossed ankle there, uh, crossed ankle here. All these little postural tendencies, two knees kind of coming into each other. I know you're holding food, but it's, some of it's avoidable, but a lot of times it's unavoidable. And these are some of the things that get us to where we uh, run into issues. So let's talk about pain for a second. When I was, uh, when I left college, I went on to the general public area. An exercise physiologist could be working in a clinical setting, like a hospital. It's right next to the emergency room. They do stress tests. Um, they, it's cardiac rehab, <coughs> essentially. And they also deal with people who have cancer and they're going through that process, uh, special needs. And it's also post-physical therapy. So someone who's gone through physical therapy and they've gone so far, now the next step would be to see an exercise physiologist. Um, I did not necessarily want to put myself in that clinical setting. I saw I could be bored after a little while. I mean, it's cool to get everybody hooked up to these tubes in the 12 lead and get them on the treadmill and put them through the protocol, but after a while, it's going to be the same old, same old. I wanted to get something different every day. So in the general public setting, uh, I ran into a lot of different weird issues. I mean, there was a lady who had a mesh stint that held her organs in place with six pins. And the hospital told me I got to get her a core strong without poking an organ with those pins. So it's it's things like that that really kind of allowed me to apply what I what I learned in college and then put me into the process that I became, which is the peanut process. So pain, the International Association of Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or actual potential tissue damage. The overall word pain is something that humans suffer and they seek help sometimes desperately to alleviate. And I've seen a lot of people um, go as far as getting injections of uh, Botox to alleviate pain. And the goal here with the peanut and what I've learned is to educate people. I think that uh, a lot of people don't realize how much, how simple it really is to kind of self heal or kind of take care of ourselves. And we end up masking it with masking pain with, with you know, got a headache, take an ibuprofen. We uh, go to the doctor with a sprained ankle, and they say, okay, well, rest, ice. Here's a script. It doesn't get better. Come back in two weeks. It doesn't get better. You go back in two weeks. What do they say? Okay, say up for an MRI. An MRI takes two months to schedule, three months to schedule, and now you're so deep into that deficit where your central nervous system shuts down that pain, and you actually have a lot of scar tissue that builds up, which is going to change your whole posture, the way you move, and that's going to cause a lot of other issues that go on. So, uh, quick story, uh, I played uh, football at Bridgewater State College, and one day I, I was blocking for my running back, we were both running backs, we were in the eye, and he I ended up getting tackled, and his helmet hit me in the Achilles tendon, and you couldn't see it, it was a balloon, and this was on a Tuesday. And I went and got it rehabbed at the athletic training room, um, I kind of was in that major at that time, so I had my little in, and I went six times a day and got treatments, and by Saturday, it's like nothing ever happened. If I was to walk across the stage to get my diploma and trip, I can't go to that training room anymore. I have to go to the doctor. I don't get that, you know, a couple days and I'm back to normal, I get rest, ice, here's a, here's a script, and it just kind of perpetuates the issue. So. You know, it's, I think that we need to look at things a little bit deeper as far as, you know, people who are just general public people going to get some sort of relief to pain. They need to be aware, and, and I think the, the industry needs to start rehabbing these people correctly. 
you guys are office type of people. You sit down a lot. You get a lot of the same kinds of issues. There's the neck pain, there's the sciatica, there's the low back pain, all these different things that kind of manifest. And why can't they rehab you the same they could rehab an athlete? Because an athlete is in all of us. It's just training them correctly and putting them through the right protocol. So let's move on and we'll talk about posture for a moment here. It's the characteristic or prescribed way of bearing one's body under the constant of gravity. We all have different postural tendencies, like I had said, um, but we also have our different jobs. Uh, that could be, you and I, we're identical twins, so genetically we're exactly the same. I'm a bus driver, okay? So I'm sitting down and I'm always turning, I'm turning to the right to open the door and I'm shifting and, you know, this arm gets a lot of use, this is just doing here. You, you're a cashier. Most cashiers always turn to the left and you're standing up. So we will have two different issues that are going to go on with us if we don't address this. So we go through life and we know that exercise is good. It's good for our health. But what does that really mean? You know, I think that looking at it from a partial standpoint is the first place to go. Um, you got people that, you know, they're in their late 40s, early 50s. They go to the doctor, get their numbers, their, their blood enzyme level and all that. And they say, ooh. Cholesterol, blood pressure, yeah, you need, to you, need to, you need to exercise, all right? What does that mean? What does exercise mean? They're gonna go to the gym and get on a treadmill. Well, if your numbers are bad, chances are you're not too healthy and you're probably a little bit crooked and a little bit heavier than you should be, and next thing you know, you go on the treadmill because that's all you know, and you run, and you get hurt. You get uh, you know, different stress fractures in the, in the ankle and in the shins. You get low back pain, you get the sciatica, super tight hamstrings, and you're only running linear. So you don't get any of the bone matrix to grow in a lateral situation, so now you're more brittle in the bones. Now you're hurting, so you have to get off the treadmill, you have to stop exercising and go to physical therapy. And what happens there is they rehab that one little area, and then you get back on the treadmill, and it's a cycle, it's a cycle. Um, and I think we need to start to change. So the whole point of this is that I left the industry, I walked away, and I said, I need to find a way to get people educated. I've helped people that have been in my area, but it's not enough. I need to get out there. And the only way was to create this product, which unofficially I really created for myself because I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was for me, but I realized that that could be the catalyst to get my information out. Uh, I'd love to, I love to educate, I love people to kind of come to the realization, hey, it doesn't have to be as hard as you know some people make it, and we need to do more than as other people make it. So as we move on, posture is our frame or our blueprint. We all are born with our blueprint. And it doesn't take very long before we start to fall out of that blueprint. Think about when we're, you know, infants or babies, you know, a couple weeks old, and we're in the crib, and now you're hungry, so you start crying and you start breathing heavy through the traps. So you already start creating issues from then going forward. But your blueprint is still your blueprint, and we can fix that to a degree as we go through our life. By being aware, by being conscious of the fact that, you know, I sit like this, I stand like this. When I coach, all right, I'll, this, is, this is me, classic, classic me. All right, I'm slamming in here. This knee's bent. All right, so this hamstring's shorter, and I just, I got the left over the right all the time. I never switch it up. It feels weird when I switch it up. And, and all of a sudden, I'm crooked, you know? So if I go right over the left and I do this, I can talk to you guys all day. When I go the other way, I can't get that heel down unless I kind of lean forward, and then I have to kind of pry myself up and I start to lose my breath. And when I bring this up, it's very hard for me to do. <sighs> so right there, I know, I'm imbalanced. You know, I, I gotta work on these issues so that I can, not run into the, the things that come on later in life where you go out there and you shovel, you rake leaves, next thing you know, I can't move my shoulder, I can't move, I can't get it off my arm, I need to go to the doctor. So performance comes right after that. Now performance could be as simple as tying a shoe in one. It could be as complicated as uh, doing an Olympic lift or playing you know, an aggressive sport like football. So there's all degrees of what performance is, but if you're in pain, chances are you're not going to perform well because you're going to avoid those movements in which pain comes. And that has a lot to do with your posture. If you can't do 
I said, I can't even balance myself. If I can't do this, how am I gonna laterally do this safely without you know tripping or possibly blowing out a knee? So it, they all kind of relate. They're all inter, inter, interrelated, but I think posture is the, the key here. So performance is the act of an action, of executing an action. I know it sounds kind of redundant, but that actually is the definition. It's the act of executing an action. It is the measurable way in which someone or something functions. So that brings me to self mild fascia release. After being in this industry and working with people, it didn't matter if it was a 12-year-old jump roping girl or a 17-year-old you know, fullback for, for football, running back, and it didn't matter if it was a 85-year-old woman who has some scoliosis and some osteoporosis going on, which is the combination is not too good. I always did the same thing in the very beginning. I would do foam rolling with that. Uh, self mild fascia release is a form of self massage. Uh, I'm, I'm sure probably some of you guys are, are familiar with foam rolling at least. It's, it's really something that I, I, I'm passionate about and that's kind of the point here today, which I'll get to in a little while. But uh, I always found myself going to the same modality, self mild fascia release, and it worked for everybody. It helped them perform better, it helped them stand or move better with their with their their, you know, their posture and it really kind of took away a lot of pain. If someone's got a sciatic issue, a true SI dysfunction is actually pretty rare, uh, but we always get sciatica. And it's just a symptom. What is the cause? You know, that's what I always look at is not not to where you fell, but where you slipped. And that's not African robber, but where did we actually slip? You know? The sciatica issue it's just this, there's a lot of different congested areas down in the hip, deep hip, and you've got the external, uh, the uh, alternate externus, and you've got your piriformis muscle, and they actually get short on one side because of the way we sit or for other reasons, and it pinches on that sciatic nerve, sending that signal of a true SI dysfunction. Some people get shots. Some people get surgery in the spine. I think we need to start with self mild fascia release first. You know, we're gonna rule that out because that is a holistic, natural way to take care of these things. And I can't tell you how many people, old and young, who have that, you know, it's like I got this pee feel right here, or I got a zing going down my leg, or I just got a dropped leg, I just feel funny, it's kind of like tingly. You have them just sit on, uh, uh, on a med ball or uh, on a foam roller, in the case now, peanut, and they cross that leg to expose that, that area, and they sit there. And it, don't, don't get me wrong, it hurts, but it, alleviates the pain afterwards. And it's just consistency, doing it all the time. But at least in that short haul, if you really can't you know, function because it hurts so much, you can take care of it right then and there. Yeah, it'll come back because it has to do with your posture, so you have to do the right stuff to get back in alignment. It has to do with your tendencies, sitting, standing, working, playing, all the things that we do that you know, create these partial deformities. But so far, fascia release is a therapeutic modality that is a broad term to describe action of mobiling, mobilizing a joint, manipulating soft tissue, and increasing circulation of the blood in lymphatic systems. Like I said, it is a form of self-massage. And the benefits of self mild fascia uh, release are, you know, the techniques are proven to alleviate both chronic and acute pain, but there's much, much more, and you'll see in a minute what I'm talking about. So, here are some of the benefits of self mild fascia release. It compresses, stretches, and lengthens muscles, tendons, ligaments, and fascia. It warms the tissue for safer activity and exercise. It increases blood flow, both acute and chronically. It promotes nutrients and oxygen rich blood flow to the tissue for quicker recovery, better contractions, and faster motor unit connections. This is one of those performance things. Uh, you see some of the athletes now, foam rolling doing that kind of stuff. Uh, runners, they got the stick and then, you know. It's getting the right types of nutrients and blood to your area so that you can repair and you can continue to, you know, essentially damage yourself. When you work out and you perform, you're actually hurting yourself, but your body repairs it and that's the whole theory of how you get strong or, you know, so this is a good way for recovery. It increases the range of motion. That is uh, one of those things that is so measurable. Uh, someone who's got some really tight hip flexors and quads, they're not going to have really good bend in their knee, okay? Two minutes rolling the quads. 
you can remeasure that joint angle, and it's going to increase by at least at least five or six degrees. Sometimes it's up to twelve degrees in, in the angle, and that, I mean that's just two minutes. So when you don't have the proper range of motion and you're out there doing stuff, of course you're going to get hurt. So this is like a preventative measure. You know, uh, we we talk about preventative medicine. What's preventative medicine? Nobody really, you know, everyone wants to do it, but no one really actually does it. Uh, preventative medicine is, is taking the time to look in the beginning, where can we start to pinpoint some of the things that create these symptoms, these issues, even all the way to heart, heart failure and, and heart attacks and heart uh, you know, syndromes. They have a lot to do with the fact that we're tight. So we've also got, it stimulates the central nervous system and prepares the central nervous system and tissue for activity. Helps to de deactivate trigger points. When I put this presentation together, I went really deep and I pull it all back and I start over. Um, I had four or five slides on trigger point alone. It's essentially something that some people don't credit and it's absolutely 100% real. I looked at it under a cross section on a microscope in college. It is in the, the, the realm of metabolism and what it is is you've got muscle fibers and the way that they shorten to make that, that joint move is they, they, they do this, okay? In a very simple way, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the, the process, but if you ever knew anything about the Krebs cycle, um, in high school you might have gone over it and it was like this big, but the Krebs cycle is probably the size of this wall as far as how far it really goes. But that's what happens and then it releases. And it happens and it releases. And happens. But every now and then, for whatever reason, partial tendencies, dehydration, lack of nutrition, uh, external force that's heavier than what your muscles can handle, one of those fibers gets stuck. So everything else releases and that gets stuck. And so the action of metabolism is a lot of byproducts, a lot of waste that is just flooding that area. And it's just all of a sudden now you get other fibers to shut down. And that's when you get that knot. You feel a little nodule. And if someone's ever done any manual therapy, therapy on you, you can really slowly get to that nodule and find that one little fiber and it sends lightning through you. It's referred pain everywhere, woo! That's the trigger point. And it's different from acupressure, different than acupuncture, all these different ingredients, and uh, you know, it's, it's really comes down to a physiological uh, process. So, and also, uh, submodifacial release also helps to break down scar tissue, calcium deposits, and adhesions. Helps to calm and relax tense muscles from stress and post-workout. So, you know, you, you guys are stressed out at work, you didn't get enough done for the day, or maybe you were late, and now you just don't know what's going on, you stop breathing up here. It's all going to lock up, and these are going to create those trigger points. These are going to create a lot of different uh, postural deformities. So, that's where it can kind of relax you. Promotes muscle tone. Uh, great for a bodybuilder, great for a bodybuilding show. Do a quick foam roll all of a sudden you pop out even more because our tissue is actually separated by fascia and you know it, it, when you get the uh, chicken strips from the grocery store, the raw chicken strips, it's kind of all kind of stuck to each other. And you got to peel them off as you're pulling them out. That's kind of what happens to our, our tissue. So you want to kind of separate it and get some space in between so they can function optimally. Um, which is the same kind of as, as the fused muscle and tissue. Uh, it also releases toxins trapped within the tissue to prevent illness and disease. We have a lot of uh, pollution around us. Uh, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, and you know, just even medication, just everything that we, we're, we're dealing with is some sort of toxin. Uh, our body should be able to filter that out, and for the most part it does, but if it gets, if we say we're tight in, in a lot of spots and we really have some deformities in our posture, it's gonna really, really get trapped. And as it gets trapped, I, I'd like to try to look at it as like a river. All right, you had a storm, branches fell down, it was the fall, so it was all these leaves, and now you got all these eddies kind of forming, and you know, all of a sudden you get a big rainstorm and it pushes it through. That's self mouthfash release. It pushes that through so that you can get new blood to the area and you can filter out the lymphatic system all of those toxins. Otherwise, they just get trapped over time and they stay there, and you know, you get cancers and you get uh, different itises and i found that a lot of people who have ulcerative colitis also have the, what I call the lazy bones posture. It's like this. And they don't have, it's no ascites. They have no, no, no butt, right? So they're just here. And they tend to get a lot of, you know, those, those digestive issues. A lot of times I see it's ulcerative colitis. 
and it's very, very difficult to deal with that. Um, it, it really kind of needs to be a combination of the treatments that they do, but also getting themselves back in alignment. Because if you think about organs, they sit in your, your pelvic floor, and they're supposed to be where they're supposed to be. An anatomy chart, you know, here's the liver, here's the spleen, here's the, you know, but you know, if I'm, if I'm doing this all day, right, what happens? All those things shift, and they move. Maybe a lymphatic duct gets trapped, or capillary gets, you know, pinched in and dies, or maybe a, a nerve is being pressed on. These are the kind of things that give us our symptoms that we run to the doctor for. And you know, I'm not discrediting going to the doctor. You need to in these scenarios, but we need to look at why this happened rather than how we solve the symptom. You know, look where you fell, look where you slipped, and not where you fell. It's, that's what I really believe. So, so all right, moving on. Uh, it reduces chemicals and hormones for natural pain relief on the physiological processes. <clears throat> Uh, if you've ever experienced self myofascial release before, you know that it hurts, uh, you know, but then eventually it hurts so good, and you actually really enjoy doing it. It becomes very meditative, and it helps you, and you feel, you know the after effect is going to be tremendous. But if you're working on an area that's tender, eventually, after a couple of minutes, all these chemicals get released from the brain, hormones, and it acts as like a natural pain killer, and you don't really feel it anymore. It doesn't hurt as bad. So that's your body giving you a natural response to pain. And I think that's much better than you know, throwing in a pill that's going to tax our uh, kidneys and all that, you know, the rest of our organs, although there is a time and a place. If you're in excruciating pain, no one wants, you know, it's suffering. You don't want to be suffering. But if you're just you know, not doing the work you should to, to take care of that, different story. You, know, you go to the doctor, you get that. Uh, sprained ankle, you know, when you fell down the podium getting your degree. Now, originally, or initially, yes, get the script. Don't want this person to be in pain, but immediately start to rehab that while they're, you know, not in pain so that they can start to get themselves back into the swing of things. And it disrupts the mechanism that causes the perpetuating cycle of constant metabolism within the saccharine of the muscle spindle. Okay, very similar to the activating a trigger point. So, the human blueprint, we talked about the human blueprint, okay? I found this little renaissance guy in a blueprint, and I thought it was pretty neat, so I put it there. Uh, your body is made up of 206 bones once you are fully developed. Uh, the bones actually are fluid. We look, you know, in, in second grade, or I don't remember the exact year, but we're in, in grade school, and we see the skeleton, right? The little model of the skeleton, and it sticks with us, that our bones are connected. They're not. They all float. So that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind when you're starting to think about pain and posture and performance in the sense that you really, you can have a, you know, something that's so tight that it's pulling that bone way out of alignment. And it could be you know, a, a small bone, it could be a big bone, but you're now not in the way you should be. And that bone also is going to start to bend because bone breaks itself down and rebuilds itself all the time. So it's going to start to bend and change form. So we got 600 muscles, 600 plus muscles. Depends on the person. Now these 600 plus muscles have protective bags called fascia. Okay. Um, if you look at human anatomy or any organism actually that's living, everything is in a tube within a tube. It's always got some sort of sleeve. Okay. Now I wore these these tall socks today on purpose. All right. So. Every now and then, you just gotta, you know, pull that sock up, so to speak. That's a tube within a tube. That's the fascia. Now, the fascia netting connects throughout. It does not separate from each other. It's one unit. It's one consistent unit. So, one muscle with 600 plus components is the way I look at the body. We don't have 600 plus muscles. We have one muscle. They are all in tune with each other. They all connect to each other, and. I think that the fascial netting is, is more what they're talking about when they are talking about the peripheral nervous system, although they've not really figured that out yet. Uh, but the, any book you read and they talk about the, the extracellular matrix, that's what this is. It's that. There's never a lot of uh, you know, literature in these books about it because it's, it's not really known. Granted, the last uh, probably eight or nine years, there's been a lot of research on it and some really good books, and uh, people are starting to understand it better. The fascia is your blueprint. It is, it is the, the foundation of everything, and if you can start to work the fascia, you're going to start to make some adaptations that are positive, for sure. 
um, your bones move through a series of compression and tension. Uh, so, you know, to, to pick this water bottle up, these are going to be compressed and these are going to be under tension. It's, it's uh, synergy, uh, synergist <laughs> and, and antagonist. It's these muscles that, you know, push and pull, so to speak. And remember, they're floating. So when your blueprint is off, we don't necessarily function optimally. A knee joint is a hinge joint. It's just like a door. The door, if it's squeaking, it means that that, that, that that hinge is rubbing against itself. And you gotta fix that. Or what do we do? We spray a little WD-40 in there. If you didn't fix it, you masked it. You know? And that's what we've been doing a lot with ourselves in the modern medicine world. We're just putting a little WD-40 in and it doesn't squeak anymore. But eventually it's gonna break down. So self-help fast release will absolutely help to bio biomechanically realign yourself. And I think that that is, I guess the, the biggest goal here and why I'm here is to kind of educate you guys on a big goal here, youth. I'd love the youth of the next couple of generations to make this a habit. Just like you brush your teeth. You know, you, you can't go to bed until you brush your teeth. You just kind of ingrained in that. You gotta do your foam rolling or your, your peanutting or, you know, some sort of self mouth fascia release. It is, it's such a healthy habit that I don't understand why we're not giving this to our youth. Physical education today is a joke. You know, and, and if they could start to implement that in a young age, I mean, it may take six or seven generations for it to be such a norm, but, you know, if that's, it starts now, okay? We need to all kind of put ourselves in that mindset. So, the issue is with the tissue, is my, one of my slogans I say a lot. Because it's really, I mean, it's not the time, right? All right. Posture. We've got our habits and tendencies, and then it creates our postural stresses. So, habits and tendencies are dictated by the way that we stand, where we sit, sleep, relax, play, work, exercise, and sometimes it's congenital by nature. Okay? So, I've uh, seen some of you guys uncrossed your legs, some of you didn't. Some people who weren't crossing now has crossed. Okay? Uh, we got Tom over there, he's got his hand on the head, he's, he's, you know, we've all got our, our tendencies. So um, that's where all this kind of comes into play. Now I want to just quickly bring up exercise and play. Uh, it kills me today to see the youth sports injury statistical uh, numbers continually going up. It shouldn't happen. It really shouldn't happen. And a lot of it is because we get so sports specific. Somewhere along the line, the media portrayed sports specific training, and all we've got is kids playing one sport all year round training for that sport. If they do go in the weight room, they're doing stuff to mimic those skills and they're creating tremendous amounts of, of, of injury risks. And that's why the numbers are so high. You know, if you're swinging a bat all the time, swinging a bat all the time, now why are you going to weight that? You know, because you really want that, that compression tension, that tension and counter tension. So if you could get this stronger, now you're going to coil and be able to actually hit better. So if you want to train sport specific, you should mimic the non, well, you, should, you, you should do the stuff that doesn't mimic the, the, the skill that you're doing. It's the opposite, complete opposite. Uh, you're throwing all the time, so why do weighted throws? Because I mean, you're gonna destroy that shoulder. You know, you should rebuild that pattern going back and you'll actually become a better athlete. Uh, anybody who was a uh, Olympic athlete, you look at what they did as, as a child, until the time they were 16, 17 years old, they play three to four sports a year. And now we're just playing one sport focused on My kid's gonna make it, he's gonna be the next Michael Jordan. Um, and as far as exercise, you're reaching for a mouse all day, you're using a hammer, you're, you know, you gotta push this over, hit it. Why are we gonna go and bench press? We're already doing that all day. We're always doing this. You should be pulling, doing the opposite of your daily routine. And that's where we actually run into a lot of issues, is that, we think we're doing good for ourselves, and I'm not discrediting anybody who tries, because you don't know, you don't know, and that's why I'm here. 